One of the beauties of this show is our unique ability to go not just behind the scenes, but also into the hearts and minds, the literal beat of our guests. What about coverage? What about the recording of what's transpired and shared via word and then print? Since the mid-90s, our guest tonight has written for and covered the party scene in Toronto, Canada and beyond. Publications like The Star, getting a special shout from radio darling Indy 88, as one of the most respected industry professionals around. We're fortunate to have him with us and highlight some of these adventures of rave, clubs, rock and roll, and what it's like to party, and remember it with such vivid detail and recall that hundreds of thousands of humans related with what was being written, or started that long journey down the water cooler road. Journalist, reviewer, chronicler, please welcome to the utility room, Ben Rayner. It's a pleasure to be here. So to have you. I'm glad the band started up again, just for us. Too. Can, can you can you still hear it? Yeah. I feel like I'm just getting the. Dum. It could be just residual memory at this point. So much awesome sauce. P has. PTSD. That's what I'm doing. I'm just having a flashback. Of of what? To the band. Oh, because you you accidentally went to the wrong. To I'm, I'm not bright. I, I made it here, so it's a pleasure to be here. I did, I did actually eventually make it into the studio, into the utility room. So, thanks for having me, and cheers. Yeah, cheers. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. What, what's, in, what's in the water in Toronto? Is there something in the water? I feel like every so often there's something. Well, I mean, after a day of rain like yesterday, there's a lot of E. coli in the water. I mean, uh, I mean like, if we think about Toronto... We punch above our weight. If that's what you're asking. Do you do you feel that? Well, there was a moment right around the turn. That I, well, think of it. Think of sort of where how, the 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 locus point from whence we're acquainted. Um, like when I arrived in Toronto in the mid '90s, it was like ground zero for rave in North America. It was the only place outside of London where drum and bass was. You know, and it was a, it was a cool city. It was a cool. Well, that was a cool thing. It was something very Toronto and unlike anything else that was going on in North America. And uh, come the turn of the millennium, we had this whole indie rock explosion that was going on. And TIFF got, the, the, the film festival became the biggest film festival in the world. Drake was coming up. The Raptors, and you know, like the, I feel like in the, in, the, in the time that I've been here, Toronto's gone from being like this kind of like banking, like the Frankfurt of Canada. Uh, to kind of a cool town without really trying. Do you get that? Like, it wasn't a cool city. Like, when we were, like, 20, 25 years ago, it wasn't a cool city. It was cool if you knew the pockets. But I feel like now there's enough, whatever is in the water is potent enough that people, I was talking to a guy today who was, was here from Brazil. He's like, this is a really, this is a really great city. I can't, I, I didn't know. And I'm like, and, and I was like, it, it, if you hadn't, like, there was no reason to come here before. But these days, I feel like you come to Toronto and go, like, the way we used to go to Montreal, or we still go to Montreal, because everyone in Toronto wants to live in Montreal. I don't know that. <laughs> but you know what? I, but now I think there are reasons to come to Toronto. I don't know if that answers the question as to what's in the water, but I think whatever's in the water is actually finally taken, uh, finally, you know, we've, we've uh, how do you say it? Uh, uh, I was going to say met, 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 metastasized, but that's a cancer reference. Met, we've metabolized it, and now we're kind of a cool town. Do you, do you think that Toronto has been made cooler because of these giant pop star instances? What, what happened when, for example, the Blue Jays won the first World Series? Was that, was that maybe one of the bigger marks for the city of Toronto, where a bunch of people... Instead of going, oh yeah, they they've got a, a major league baseball team there. No one was ever talking about hockey because I mean that just yeah. that hasn't that hasn't been won since the late sixties. Um, it probably won't be won until the twenty sixties. I mean, uh, who knows? You you want to say never say never? I I, I got to tell you, uh, just as I'm, I'm digressing super quick, but <laughs> once the Maple Leafs win, oh this is like all fire. in Toronto. This city is. Fucking well, I, I remember the noise the <laughs> night because I think we're so starved for that stuff. The night the Raptors won, and I remember go, like I watched it in, at the Monarch or someplace, and I went home, and I because I had some work to, work to do, which didn't get done because I was half cut. But I, I and I remember going out to to smoke a cigarette or a, a joint on my patio, like my balcony, uh, at 
4.30, maybe, 4.38 or something like that. And it still sounded like there was a festival or something going on off in the distance. And I was like, this is very on Toronto. But since this, this whole pandemic nonsense erupted, Toronto's been very on Toronto. It's reminded me of like Amsterdam in the late 80s and you 90s. Know, I, I had such giant hope for Nuit Blanche. And I feel like it's been the strangest of executions. It's almost as if they, there, there's like a, a pull against the participation. It's certainly not very open. It's uber wide in a, in a nuisance type of way. And, and, it's, and it's also like, the, it's very like to the rules and participation. So if something renegade art wanted to start up, there's a discouragement towards yeah. that as well, which is, which is weird because if you think about any successful festival, regardless of what it is, in the parking lot as a tailgate or in the camping grounds, there's some, there's some micro parties going on. I, I remember it just in, it, at WEMP, I in 20, what was the, what was the year WEMP where uh, Skrillex and, and Calvin Harris played? 2010. Okay, so that year, some, some kids, they came up to me like, as soon as I finished, they're like, what are you doing right now? I'm like, oh, they're come party. Fuck yeah, let's go party. Like we've got like a tent. With like set, like decks and, and mixer and sound, it, you're gonna love it. I get there. This tent was massive. I don't know. It fit like a hundred people, and they got it, and it was an amazing party, and I had a great time. And and this type of stuff when it happens, because the party is the people. It's not. The yeah. Act. I mean, if you can have, you can have a giant stage and uh, with giant talent, and giant lights yeah, and lasers if, and sound. If, if, the if there's no one, right. if there's no, and if there's no one there, then what do you got? Yeah. Right. You got a setup. You know. So so, I feel like. Circling back to my thought with Nuit Blanche, when you don't have that that style of participation. Although one of the best, like I usually, I like Nuit Blanche. Uh, I haven't thought about that in ages. I guess we haven't had one. But I usually leave town for it because it was such garbage the first. Like the, there was, I think there was one year when they had some money and then it just kind of tailed off. It's like, hey, I got a fog machine. I got some projections. I do feel like play, it started like, off with a bang and has and has yeah. definitely been like a, a. I don't know. I there be one or two good things. How, how is it, for example, that, I, I mean, I don't even know what's behind the scenes because it, it's absolutely closed and it's not open. If I was going to think about Burning Man, for example, you can go online and you can check out the org and, and you can see almost every step of the way and, and how the decisions were made and why. And then, of course, they've got a message board with discussion so that if people are in agreement or disagreement or in the middle of the road, they could all meet there and, and share each other's yeah. thoughts. There's, there's nothing like this for, for Nuit Blanche. No, I, but I, I was going to say the, the best time I've ever had was like a friend of a friend. Uh, I had just thrown up. He had a, a little a portable sound system, a pretty good one. Oh, too. I thought you were and like a mixing rig. And we and they they'd set up next to the next to the uh, courthouse, the old courthouse, and uh, and we just throwing like a thing, like a renegade party. Mm. And that's and it actually brings me back to my point. Like the the, the last couple of summers of having nothing to do in Toronto, I kind of like that there were. Renegade parties again because oh, it felt like the old days. Recently, now we're talking. Yeah, we're, but we're I just I like, that, I like that that's going the, on. I like that that like insurrection is going on. I feel I, like that's the I vibe. Adore that I, that it's going on. Yeah. I, I have FOMO for missing other. I, the, the one that the the one that went viral almost like around North America was the under the bridge rave that had hundreds of people at it. I, did you see the video from this? This the recently one. This I don't know. This is like five or six weeks ago. That oh, I'm you know but now now, I now they're all, I have a good story about one though. Would that happen over the course of the summer? I was looking for a place to call my therapist one night after, and I was working out on the Danforth, and I walked down to Riverside Park, and I sat down on that like, giant hillside where you can watch the sunset and get a nice view of the city, and I called my therapist, because I was just like, I was leaving work, and I was like, I haven't talked to a guy in a while, I was, whatever, I was down, I suffer from depression uh, occasionally, and while I'm talking to him, People are setting up like a sound system down the ball field, and I'm watching it go. And, and I'm like, I think I don't know what's going on. It looks like someone's setting up a sound system. It's expecting it to be like you know someone's birthday, but it was like a really powerful fucking system. And this 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 girl gets up and starts throwing down serious drum and bass as the sun is setting. I'm like, what the fuck, what the fuck is going on here? And kids start. I mean, I'm talking kids because you know we're in our middle age now. Dressed like we, like our contemporaries would have gone to parties 20 years ago. Like fun for everything. And they had like the cyber raver posse and you had like the, and it just started flooding the ball field at Rivers. And then, and then another, like a guy got on, it was like just banging kind of Carl Coxie techno for a while. 
And it made the news. I, I stayed there till like 10, 30 or 11 when the police arrived and shut it down. The police had been there all night trying to shut it down, but the guy was like, this isn't a party, this is a protest. And I was like, oh my God, this is the best therapy ever. See, you know, right? So I, 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 I paid the guy 120 bucks or 140 bucks and talked to him while this thing set up. And I, and I called my, my long-suffering partner. I was like, I got to stay and see what's going on here. And I had the best time. I went down and like just stood in it. Because I haven't been to like a party, you know. Last weekend I would have been at Harvest. Usually I couldn't afford to go this the, to the the little party this year. Lots of things are a little weird, but I, you know, and I, and I, that was the, my favorite thing about that whole scene was being. I love outdoor things. Like oh, I did twenty ohms, you know. And, and uh, I like the origins of rave culture. Like, and I feel like that was one of the cool things that stemmed from this pandemic was people just. Breaking the law and so 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 is this a re return to the subculture? Would you say that the subculture became culture, and then and then now the pandemic has has, I guess not maybe forced is the wrong word. Yeah, and I I, I know yeah, and I but I and I, I rebirth. Yeah, well, that that spirit is definitely there, the and spirit. I and I mean people hone in on like the anti mask grave and I, whatever. Like I I don't give a shit about your politics on either side of that, and I'm sick and tired of talking about. It. But I like. I like that these are renegade parties going on, like at Cherry Beach or in Riverside Park, and the or under a bridge. It reminded me of being like eighteen years old again, and and doing that stuff. And I I still like occasionally throw jams on like friends' properties with my friends. We all take turns DJing, and you know, and that's where it started. You know what I mean? And I like I I like the kind of lawlessness of it. I am an old punk rocker as much as I am an old raver, and I don't. Like, I like it when people break the rules. What is the difference between being a punk rocker and a raver? I don't think there's that much difference. I, I don't think, think so either. But although, I will say this, and I think you and I had this conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago. When I moved here, still, I had, like, my rock friends and my electronic friends, right? And never the twain did meet quite often. Like, it would be like, ah, I almost not that electronic music. It's like, that's not real music. Still, this is, we're talking, like... I moved here in 98, so I'll say even when I was in, like going to uh, university in Ottawa. So in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, because I would listen to it. I, I liked, you know, Massive Attack, but I also liked Madonna, and I also liked The Clash, and I also liked Slayer. And, and none of those things have ever changed. And it's like, but I, I do remember there was still a schism. Like, I had my friends, like, and other rock critics would be like, you go to those weird, you go, like, I, said, I remember the editors of my paper used to call, you go to those late night sex parties. I'm like, I wish they were late night sex parties. <laughs> But they're not. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but I still have my friends who are like, I, I can't, I don't understand that music. And now that's changed, right? They're like, they kind of blood away. But I, I do like that it, because the clubs will be the last, nightclubs and, and parties will be the last thing to be, to return. Like that's being, and the best part of that is being close up in a closed space with a bunch of sweaty people coughing on you. You know what I mean? So I, I, I kind of like that it, it gave it an outlaw edge again. You follow me? What happens to you when you're listening to music? Um, well, that's my whole... I'm, I'm definitely happier. I, 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 I like the... I like nothing more than being at a show or a, a DJ gig or like a, anything where... I, that's, I mean, that's why I have Plastic Man tattoos, because Rich Richie Houghton will, will do that to me, or like a band like A Place to Bury Strangers, where I'm like, this is fucking ridiculous. Like, how is this happening? It's so good. When I love something, like in the moment, you know, I, like, and I think of it, look, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about <laughs> my favorite set. But it's, 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 I love that moment when you're, you kind of lose your, you kind of dissolve into, into, into the, the sound. Like you lose yourself, you're out of yourself. You forget about yourself. And I like that. I like it when music makes me forget about it. When it's everything. And it's, it's just like whatever, whatever buttons it's pushing in you at the, at the same. Like I, I missed a Julianne Baker show. I forgot about it on Sunday. But she's like the sad, queer, Christian songwriter from like Georgia or something. You know, like it's the saddest stuff in the world. Because imagine being a queer Christian in the, the deep American South. But I love, I'll go to those shows and like burst into tears. All right, but it's a different feel. I just like... Something that makes me feel something. Does that make sense? You, what's what? You, the same thing for you. You know, your favorite music. It pushes buttons. I think that that's what DJs are. Is they're feeling distributors. Yep. Yeah, I like it. I, and I love, I love 
DJs who, like a, a really good DJ who can dismantle everybody. And I, I've, I like, I'll, he's a great one. I watched Kevin Saunderson and Derek May tag team one time and they had like, I can't remember if they had three decks each or two decks each, but they had like a bunch of different mixes of Plastic Man Spastic going on at once. And I watched the, like, the dance floor, we go there, it's like fucking Derek May, so you're getting Lil Lewis, the, you know, French kiss and like to dance. And then the two of them, it's like, you know, going. And I watched people just like crumble and stop. And they're just not, no one's dancing. Everyone's just kind of standing there, like wondering what's going on. Or Adam X could do that to me. Like, I like, I like people who can tear you apart. And I think that's it. But you can kind of like, again, you, you it's, it's sort of like a, a really powerful hallucinogen where they, you know, you get the loss of self, but you, you're not thinking, you know, you're not thinking about anything else. You kind of are, I know it sounds cheesy, but you kind of become one with music, right? And it's passing through. I'm one of the things I always liked about the, like the dawn of, of, of like the rise of uh, electronic dance music um, was the fact that there was no, like, no established, I mean, there was, like we responded instinctively to rhythm, but people were making like from Kraft, Kraftwerk or, or Stockhausen or whatever, but you, when you're making sounds that nobody has ever heard before, they're gonna go work to work on people differently because there's no like biological precedent for what's going through you. That, and I, I always think that's cool. Like uh, that's why like uh, that sort of futurist side always appealed to me because I'm like, what is you know, like cavemen weren't in a room with <laughs> thousands of watts of sound beating them down. And I do like it. I like it dark and uh, aggressive and uh, and you know efficient. But I like stuff that goes to work on you emotionally a little bit, which is why I like. I, and I, I I know that like. No disrespect, but like a Tiesto goes to work on you emotionally in a different way. But I like, I like to be <laughs> broken apart. It's almost like a, like a cult conditioning ceremony. Did you know you wanted to write? Uh, yeah, I wanted to be a music writer from the time I was like I could read my dad's uh, like Rolling Stones. What was stereo. it? What was it? What, like, what was the call? Well, I'll, my parents met working for a newspaper. Um, in the UK, and then my father became a music teacher. My mother remained a journalist, so I think biological determinism played a large part in it. Because I, yeah. but I, I writing's hereditary. Yeah, it's definitely. I like having a music teacher dad. It was just like, oh, I guess this was probably meant to happen. But I, I, I would always like when I was a kid, dad had like an, an old typewriter, and I would just go and write on it, like little short stories and stuff. I'm a nerdy kid, but I liked. You know, I like, but then by the time I was seven or eight, I like, I, I started taping all my dad's records. And then I think my first album at eight, age eight was Rick Springfield's Success Hasn't Spoiled Me Yet. And I've been buying music ever since. And it was just like, this is really cool. And then once I hit, like when I was about 11, a friend of mine lent me a copy of the Jesus Mary Chain Psycho Candy, uh, which is probably too young to have a copy of the Jesus Mary Chain Psycho Candy. But that totally changed my life because I was like, here's this whole world of music that's not, known to everybody, right? Like, you, there's, there's, this is the time of Madonna and, uh, the, you know, Europe's the final countdown and whatnot. And I just, like, it, 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 it alerted me to the, the world beyond the mainstream. And from that point on, I was just kind of like, I wanted to read and read and read and find out about stuff I didn't know about. And then by the time I was, to, like, honestly, like 12 or 13, I was like, I want to be a music writer. Because I liked, I saw what my mom would do. Because when I was a kid, sometimes I'd go on stories with her, and it's like, today we're going to the aquarium. Today we're going on a boat. Today we're going to fly out to Grand Manan Island. You know, and you just get to do cool stuff, and it's not the same stuff every day. And like, hang out with people, talk to people, like we're doing now. And it seemed like a cool gig, and I really liked music. So I went, I went to, you know, four years of J school, at journalism school at, at Carlton in Ottawa, and being told, oh, you'll never get a job doing that. You know, you'll never get a job doing that. And I did, like right out of school. And I, I kind of was like, when I, whenever I talk to like students or how, uh, to speak to a journalism class or something, they're like, oh, what drew you to music journalism? And I'm quite honest when I say it. I like going to bars, listening to music, and sleeping in light. And that provided me, and talking to musicians, you know. But the, well, I, I grew up with one, so I don't need to talk to them all the time. The first three parts are the salient points. Um, and I did that for like, I've, I've done that for a living since I was like 20. When you were ever covering a performer, an artist, a band, did you ever 
feel any of their pressures of touring? Yeah, well, I mean, I have a lot of friends who who were musicians, and it's a you either I, that's why so many bands blow apart right away. I mean, you, the way, it, we were talking about this the other day, but, but it's it's hard when you're alone, I think. But it's I I would argue um, as someone who usually has at least one good blowout with anybody, I'm a, my my partner or like a friend when I'm on a trip. Like, imagine spending like. 250 dates, playing 200 dates a year with like three or four other dudes and having to be with them all the time. And I just think that that's the, that's why so many bands blow apart after they get big and they go on a world tour or they, you know, their first big tour, it's like one guy leaves or we just, we're done. They walk away from it. I feel, uh, I, it's exhausting. And I think just being like, observing those interpersonal relationships <laughs> 24 hours a day or like during your waking hours during that period is, is way more taxing. You're just never sleeping, eating garbage, being handed drugs and booze at every turn. Like Were backstage attitudes contagious? What do you mean by that? When you were hanging, I'm asking about the feelings and stuff because, well, I mean, you're coming into this and, and you're bringing all of your feelings already. Yeah. And you've got this encyclopedia of music and feelings inside of you and, and, and so you're approaching this and you're stepping into a situation whatever you're stepping into who knows good night bad night before it good week bad week before it yeah. all of a sudden there's all these feelings in this situation never mind that, that whoever the artist band performer is when they're performing is broadcasting the feelings yeah. so and then, and then what happens when you go backstage is there is it a crazy rush and surge of energy because the performance is about to take place? Do you get wrapped up in that? Uh, yeah, if I have the like, I like it's. I'm often I like it's not like when I'm when I was reviewing shows all the time. It's you kind of you, you kind of have half the feeling that you're missing out a lot of the time because everyone around you is having a a wild old time and, and they they don't go to four or five shows a week. This is the one show they're going to, like, this month, or, like, the, we go to three or something, you know, the, me and the wife are out, the, the kids are in bed, and they're partying. And I'm up on the lawn in the middle of it, like, I love, I'm wearing a Judas Priest belt buckle right now. It's something like that, which I love. It's like, I'm at a metal show, everyone this puke around me, everyone, but I, you know, I, gotta, I can only have a couple of drinks because I got to go back and write to deadline. And that, so, like, to, to, that was a lot of being a music writer. Was it like, I gotta leave early? Oh, fuck, I'm not gonna see the encore, I got a deadline. Well, that's, that's the unglamorous side of it. But yes, yeah, sometimes you get to hang out backstage and it's cool. I, I've been on stage with bands. Like, I was on stage in front of 50,000 people. We were watching, like, from the side of the stage when, I mean, this is like when Broken Social Scene from Toronto were just coming up, but they're old friends of mine. My, my Gail and I were there. And we were just hanging out. We had band passes, so we just hung out on the side of the stage. You've got like 50,000 people in front of you. And it's, you know, you felt that energy. You've been in front of big crowds, and it's it is, it's it's a uh, it's a rush. Even if you're not part of it, and especially I think I was lucky because a lot of my circle of my my uh, you know, extended family and friends kind of blew up around the same time that I I got here. Like that, the the whole broken social media metrics. It was all a lot of people that I knew suddenly became kind of big. And I would go to something like South by Southwest in Austin, and I'd watch my friends, the Deers or like the Constantines or whatever, play a show to people, and they were excited about the music outside of Toronto, because it's it, you know you sometimes you you're like this thing you know when you when you uh, when you're a fan of a band, but also acquainted with it, you're like are they just a big fish in a small pond or my you know how would this fare outside? But when Toronto indie rock, in particular, kind of blew up um, around the turn of the millennium. It was fucking crazy. Like to go, like every year I'd go to South by Southwest. One year, like I'll use Metric as a guy, but one year they're playing like a club. The next year they're playing Stubs to three thousand people. Then, then you know, <laughs> they're playing the ACC, and then you watch like people you've been, you've known, and been involved with for years uh, reach those levels. It's pretty cool. You feel apart, like it, it was nice. To, it was nice to be on the fringes of it. You know what I mean? Were you ever in conflict with a writing assignment? 
I am almost always in conflict with the writing <laughs> Why? I'm a, well, <laughs> mainly because I hate writing, and I've hated it ever since I took it on as a profession. Like, it's not a pleasant thing for me, but I, I, uh, I'm not e easy to work with. Um, why? Why? I, why, this you, why, you, this you, why? You feel that on your own. You're not waiting for someone else to come and say that. No, I, if I agree with something, it's it's great. But I, I have, I did, there's a reason why I stopped trying to play in bands and like, yeah, because <laughs> I, I don't, you know, some people don't play well with others. I just. I've been more like Prince. I'd like to be in control of everything. Wow. I'm a very a genial guy, but I, I just don't like other people's bullshit, and I, I, I like things done my way, you know, I, which I think is fair. So you're but, human. Yeah, I'm human. Okay. Um, yeah, there have been things I've been... Although I, 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 I will say, like, I was the star 20, uh, 22, almost 23 years, like whatever, you know. Uh, I never really had that much they were really quite lenient with me. Like, they never said no. They're sort of like, you can't ignore Jennifer Lopez or Justin Bieber when he comes to town, but you can write about, you know, Neutral Milk Hotel or Tool. Or, you know, it's like Tool's not a bad example because they're huge, but, but I could do kind of obscure stuff and they had, and, and they would let me do, like I had a column called like Reasons to Live for Years, which is like a dumping ground for like horror movie trivia and, and records that would never get written about anywhere else, right? Like, um, and I, so I, I, I my, my conflict, do you want a good story? I'll tell you, one of the, one of the <laughs> we might want some. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, well, I, but I do have conflicts from time to time. And one, one of the most, well, it's, this was the beginning of the end of me with the newspaper industry. So I got, a, I got, say, reassigned. I did it voluntarily, out, under pressure, to the features um, section. I think it was a six-month thing or something. They went, they, like, wait, I, the guy who hired me took me out to lunch for, for beers one day and was like, "If you look, they want you to they want you to switch your music to features." And I was like, "I don't want to do that. I like writing about music. <laughs> like, I, this is my dream job. I, my whole life, I wanted to do this, and I've been doing it." For, 12 or 13 years in. And uh, I agreed, because he was very persuasive to do it for a few months. And it didn't work out for everybody. We didn't get along, because I was often in conflict with the editors. And uh, the most illustrative example uh, I can recall is one day, I was handed a, a story from the New York Times about how, I'm not kidding, I wish I was kidding, but this is the sad truth. And I'm I'm quite happy to burn some more bridges with this one. Um, it was a story about how boneless chicken wings, which, as we all know, aren't chicken wings at all, it's just the chicken breast cut up into pieces, were on the rise because for the first time in whatever American history, because this was from the New York Times, chicken wings were more expensive than chicken breasts. So I was like, so you want me to plagiarize a story from the New York Times? And they were like, no, you can't plagiarize an idea. So the first thing I did was call Chicken Farmers of Canada. And I said, okay, so uh, this is Ben Rainer from Toronto Star. I've been asked by my editors to do a stupid story about how boneless chicken wings, which we all know aren't chicken wings, are now more expensive than chicken wings because are, are, are now on the rise because chicken wings are more expensive than chicken breasts. And the guy, this is the first call I make. This is like 10 minutes after the assignment. The guy goes, no, no, that's only in the States. And there's like about three giant corporations that control the chicken market in the United States, and they manipulate the market. He's like, it's total bullshit. And he's like, I'll look up the price of chicken breasts versus chicken wings for you in Canada. And it was right now, right now. He's like, oh, it's about $1.67 a pound or whatever, two sixty-seven a pound of chicken wings, five thirty-three for chi for chicken breasts. Like, exactly the opposite of what I was told. Oh, no, they're twice the price of chicken wings. He's like, in Canada, no. It's chicken breasts are still twice the price. So I go back to the editors, and I was like, this isn't a story. Like, this is a bullshit story. You want me to plagiarize a story that isn't a story? And one of them sat down, and he was like, I still think there's a story here. <laughs> and we, it dragged on for days and days and days. Until someone, someone on that upper echelon really, oh, someone really they wanted needed that. that chicken. Oh, they, they needed, wanted that story. They it was like, this is such a great, but they didn't want to admit that they were wrong. Right. And it dragged on and on. And I, I still, so in the end, I started writing the fucking story. And it was, and I led with, 
The New York Times recently reported, that, <laughs> like, exact, but in Canada, it's not true. And, and that caused even more conflict with the others. They were like, oh, you can't do that. It sounds like we're ripping off the New York Times story. And I was like, we are ripping off a New York Times story, and it's not a story. So that, there you go. There's a good example. You've got... But I, I saw it through. I saw that fucker through. I'm assuming you've got, like, whoa stories. So, and there must be something that still to this day is a great party tale. Something that you could not say, for example, in, in your typical, what I would rate as a, a PG environment here in the utility room, we're, we're, not, we're not hindered by these types of ratings where, you know, we could say nearly anything. Yeah, I, I you know what, I, 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 like, I'm trying to think of a really good one. Like, I, I, I've, I've, I've been around a lot. Like, yeah, yeah. Let's let's circle back to it. What do you feel yeah. like were some of the challenges that you dealt with when when you were writing about raving? Uh, well, when I started here, it was that nobody would talk. Like none of the promoters and the artists would talk to mainstream media because they thought it was going to be a story about drugs and kids being right. When I started, it was I was right when I started at the Star. Was that kind of crusade against? the city crusade against uh, using like the Better Living Center, right? No, nothing on city property. And it just became that the, the police held a press conference saying this is just, they are a haven for drugs and guns. No, guns. Is this, Did you ever see a gun? Is this a, like the, the, but, the mark, the, the, the bookmark to, to let you know it was at that time that you knew that that music genre was going to explode as soon as it had a negative connection that was associated with it. But that kind of, like... I, I, I mean, if you think back to heavy metal, like, what did Kiss go through? And, or and Judas it, Priest. And, that's right. So if we, think, if we think about that, this was the rise of that genre it's of true. music because it was associated with the bad deeds that could potentially happen if you were listening to or went and attended this party. And then, and then of course, the same thing with hip-hop. You know, it was not... They yeah, need a boogeyman. It, it, that's right. If, if the music genre doesn't have a boogeyman, does it ever culturally explode? Well, I mean, it, it did kind of, like, dismantle that whole giant party. Which I didn't think was a bad... Like, the worst thing. I mean, those, those huge... Like, the, I, I mean, they were fun once in a while. Like, at the International Center or the Better Living Center or whatever. But, but I... I I mean, it did it. It kind of knocked it back into clubs, which I kind of I'd like, which was kind of a bummer for a while. Because I like, I don't like going to clubs as much as I like going to weird places to hear music. You know what I mean? And then, and I think that's that kind of derailed it for a while here. But going back, to the the one thing I was going to say to follow up on your earlier point though was when I started, no nobody would nobody wanted to talk to to reporters because they get burned every time, and. One of the cool things about, but that was right when I started the start too. It was like it was the peak, that late nineties, like crazy. I like I got the start to give twenty five thousand dollars to I Dance, right? Like they were a sponsor. They wouldn't hang banners up, but they they gave like they the Lauren, their logo was present, and they were the they were but they were presented. they were like they I think they get twenty five or fifty grand. Like right. I, I don't know the figures, but it was like, but that, but I I think I that was like the, the, the my. If I had a calling card, because nobody fucking knew me. I'd just arrived from Ottawa, and I hadn't even been writing. I got kind of lucked into a job in Ottawa because I'm charming, and I can bullshit. Uh, and I, but I, I was actually, you know, I was in my early 20s, like very early 20s, and I was actually someone who went to these events, right? And they, like, that was my in, because usually they'd send, like, a reporter our age now who'd never experienced a, a rave, to cover an event, and then it would be some story about, oh, and some of the kids said they were taking ecstasy, or whatever. And that, that was the narrative. So I would just, I would just cover it from, a, a, like, a musical standpoint. Often I'd interview, like, electronic artists and stuff. And when I wrote about the rave scene, I had a column, and I had a Saturday column. It was in defense of it, and within it. And I, so I, that, that was my only, like, I guess I was lucky that I was one of the only reporters that anybody would talk to because I would present it honestly and even handedly. And that was that that was that was that was kind of cool. Like I, I think about it in hindsight, I was like, oh, that was kind of cool. 
Like I, 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 I landed in, in the Toronto scene from a, a very, a very, very small scene in Ottawa, uh, which was awesome because you'd see the same faces at every, which kind of happened here. But, but, but that that was neat, and it was it was nice to be embraced by the, the like-minded people here. Right when I moved to, it became my extended family. Like, again, I, w I went to 20 homes. I went to my first home, and I never stopped going. And that, that like, I planned my whole year around that party or harvest or something like that because I'm a bit of a hippie raver. But, but that, those, that most of my my uh, closest and longest lasting friendships of the last 25 years have been made through that through our scene, and that's that's all you need to know, right? Like, you have these intense hangs with people sometimes for days on end. When they become your friends, or you, or you never want to see them again. But I, uh, but that's, but those are few and far between, right? Like you find you, you find your tribe, and I, I totally found my my tribe through this, this this weird life that I chose, and I was able to kind of like be more of a part of it than I thought I would be. Is that is that what it is? Is this is this a weird life? Is is music life a weird life? Well, you tell me. It is kind of a weird life. You get the only you're like. Even now, like I've, since I, I, I stopped writing full time, I've been working. My other dream job was always to work for a record store. I've been working for Tops Records, and I can't believe. And I'm in charge, as you know. Uh, I'm in I'm in charge of like, processing all these collections of twelve inches that they buy. And twelve inches, when you think about, it, span basically our lifetime. It's like sort of disco through eighties, through techno house, right? Like that's that's when they start. So it every day it's like opening a box of wonder because it's like fuck me like the you know the thompson twins or erasure or i've i've, I've now amassed all the the billy idol which <laughs> is like a man could want but things like that and it, it uh, and i and it's like you're you're in an environment with people who only work in that environment because they love music and i i've been very lucky to, to i haven't grown up with a music teacher dad too so we had a house full of instruments we all had cool keyboards and synths and and like mad stereo equipment, and and uh, it was just I was never questioned that music wasn't going to be part of my life. I think, and I, I'm, I'm, but it is you know when you think about people who don't live it, it's quite alien to them. You know, we have all friends who who kind of became old, young, and just like they haven't. You know, oh, I haven't really listened to music since Pearl Jam. But. When you were writing, were people like that ever on your mind? Or, for example, the small town kid, person, music fan that lived in something Ontario that was a hundred miles away, but still the Toronto Star reached. I I love it, man. When I was growing up. Uh, Brave New Waves on CBC Radio was it was like an overnight show, and it was that was where I first heard Sonic Youth and Nirvana and Dinosaur Jr. and uh, all kinds of crazy shit. Like I was like I I would stay up. It was I think it started at like one. Yeah, this is like high school, junior high. So you're like trying very hard to stay awake, and you know you got to get up at seven. But that and City Limits on much music, right? So you'd hear all the the cool like Creation Records bands and and Four AD bands. And actually, a lot of like early electronic music, like uh, it, it just that had such an influence on me. Um, well, we wouldn't be talking, right? My 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 neighbor down the down Pancake Hill. We lived with. We used to grow buckwheat on the the top of the hill where I lived as a kid, and you run it. Uh, she lent me that a copy of Psycho Candy by the Jesus Mary Chain, and like some records by the Damned and, and the Church, and I forget. You know, a couple other things but she'd heard them on Brave New Waves and City Limits and that was all we had we didn't have like a CFNY we were in Charlotte County it was, it. It was nothing it was like Phil Collins <laughs> you know you might Duran Duran was about as cool as it got so so that that having access to that stuff I think is the reason the reason why I like I still I'm kind of true. like I, I like turning people on to cool stuff it's like being a it's the same thing as being a DJ you want people to hear the cool records Right, you want people to hear and like love the stuff you love, and that was that's what being a, a music writer for God since I was like eighteen, nineteen um, has been to me. It's just like you want to turn people on to cool stuff. That's so slightly egotistical component to it, but but in the end, you're just kind of like you should. I want you to hear this, 
And I still do that to my friends. Like, I never tell my friends, you should hear this. But I, I know what, like, say, my sister-in-law likes or my, even my brother. Um, I'll be like, you should listen to this. You'll like it. And I never do that. Because, but I have an instinct for that. You know what I mean? And I like that when someone's like, fuck, that was great. Like, someone stopped me in the, the street the other day. And I, she was like, because my Twitter handle is I hate Ben Rainer. She's like, I hate Ben Rainer. And I was like, hey. She's like, I really miss your writing. And I was like, well, I still write a little bit. She's like, you should write more. She's like, you turned me on to so many cool bands. And just walked off. And that was like the nicest thing, right? At Chester and Danforth. Just out of the blue. Because I haven't really been writing. Like, I quit Star and, or like March of, it's been, a, it's been a, you know, more than a year. So it's nice that someone remembers because I haven't done a lot. Like, I've been avoiding the writing as much as possible. Why? Because it, I find it incredibly painful. And also, I wrote for a living from 18 till to 44 without a break. I never had a gap year. I never took a year off. I went straight in, like, from high school to journalism school. And I got hired before I was even out of school. I guess, you know, I'm good. But um, I never had a break from it. It was just the same thing. And I think... Part of uh, music journalism that grinds you down, at least grinds me down. Like, I don't like to phone it in. So I put a lot of myself into everything. Even I'm, I'm working on a band bio right now. It's driving me nuts. Like, it's like, I keep putting it off, putting it off, because I don't like it. I don't, you don't want to put your name, even though my name's not on it, but it's for a friend. I don't want to put my name on anything I can't stand by. So uh, it just, I think doing the same thing again, and again, like six, seven days a week for, 22 years, 25 years, I guess, if you roll on the Ottawa Sun stuff. Um, it started to get to me, and also my job was going to disappear, and I knew it, and I don't really know how to do anything. Well, I do, but I don't want to do anything else. I like music. And I just, but I, I, it got to the point where I would just sit at my computer and stare at it, and I, I, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore. You know, you need a break sometimes or shit. Like, I, I just, I had a, I, I just, even now, like it actually sometimes causes me a bit of anxiety just to open that laptop. I was like, oh, shit, I gotta do this now. So it's been nice not writing. Like it drove me a bit batty. Wild. It really did drive me batty. So has this been a reset for you? Do you no, it's been great. Like I, 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 took, I, I took a, I was lucky I'd been there so long and it was a union job. So I had some money uh, coming in for more than a year just to be a full-time dad and it was the best thing like it was the best thing it probably saved my life like i i, I it was just like it was a good six months where my kid was off preschool and we went to stay with a friend of mine because i was like this is the moment gail when in the horror movie when you get out of town because I, I was still going to south by southwest until like the saturday before everything shut down you know what i mean and on the monday i canceled my ticket because i was like i'll just go and hang out Festival's off. I have friends down there. I'll just go and hang out. And we, my a buddy of mine, my friend Jason, had a room. We, we got like a $30 a night room there. Because all of a sudden the rates are cut. <laughs> and then Monday I was like, oh no, fuck this. And can't, like cut the, k killed the ticket. Right. And then by Wednesday, everything was, like Wednesday or Thursday that week, everything was shut down. On the Tuesdays, so my, my, a friend of mine offered to take us in up north. And I was like, this is the moment, the horror movie when you get out of the city. And we left for a week. And we stayed up on the highlands for a month. And I, because my, my uh, partner works for uh, Kids Home Phone and trains counselors. And the other person I was staying with was on like the disaster management council of the local uh, uh, township. So I was like, I got to get the kid out. And we just went and played in the woods or on the water all day, every day for a month or five weeks or how long it was. And then we kept doing that when I got back to Toronto. We were outside all day. We'd walk up here. We would go up here, like, to... She'd be like, go on and go to Black Creek. So I'd walk her up to... She'd nap, and I'd walk her up to Black Creek, and we'd play on Black Creek. And I, di I did that for for six months of my life, and it was, like, the best summer of my life. Just hung out with, like, a kid. As she was three at the time. So you've had a good pandemic. I, I did. I felt guilty, because it was like I... I was having such a lovely time. And she, during that time, I'd try to route past a different crap brewery. <laughs> so dad would have a few beers and a weed gummy. And, and I hung out with my kid all day, every day for six months. And I still, I kind of get sad. Like I got a bit sad because Earl's Court Park back here was one of our hang spots. 
but we just explored the city together. It was the best. And it was, and, I, and after that month up north, at my friend Nancy's, uh, she was like, you're not going. She's like, when you go back to Toronto, you call the star and you leave. She's like, I haven't seen you this happy in a while. And it was like, yeah. Because I, I went, I was, I had a really, really, I had a really, really dark period where I was like super depression and, and stuff. So my kid kind of saved my life, dude. You got a kid. You know how it goes. They're pretty fun. They're good, they're good hangs. I've got you in the hot seat right now. I'm going to ask you the most challenging question. All right. The entire session that we've had together. Are you ready? Yeah. You've got three records that you you think that these records are records that helped move electronic music forward from subculture to popular culture. So are we talking singles or albums? I want to say I, it could be either could be or. Either. It could be either or. I mean, if I was, I, I, I'm going to reference a single right right now, and, and 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 hopefully it's not on that list. And 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 if it is, then awesome, yeah. we're in agreement. Yeah, and, yeah. And if not, then you get to share a, a yeah. different perspective yeah. with me, which is awesome. And and the single that I would use would be Higher State of Consciousness. Yeah. This was a super underground record that somehow seemed to have poked through. And. Poke through to a higher state of consciousness. Indeed, indeed. What would you say that these three records are? I, well, I think, I think people like Josh Wink like caught that that moment and kind of popularized stuff. Like, it, like I love. See that first. I I I, 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 don't know, I pick three. I, I do a friend's show all the time. He's like, bring three records, and I bring like twenty. Um, but I, but I, I, those people who kind of caught, like, kind of rope rope people in but i fuck, i don't know like i like obviously i love plastic man i love richie hot and i think sheet one is amazing the first plastic man album i think spastic is maybe my favorite techno track of all time just because it's like so minimal, like not quite as minimal as the stuff on like uh closer that would come later which is boop, boop, boop. but you can mix that with anything and it's just a pure assault and if you don't like it you're out of the room right like i i it's just Fuck, are you in? You're in. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other other ones that I, I really like. I'm, try, I think I'm, I'm like thinking into my like 12 inch stacks now from when I'm playing records, like spinning out. I. Um, there's so many. I love Three Little Dirty, Three Little Birdies Downbeats by the Chemical Brothers on that uh, higher state of consciousness. But I'm trying to think of the ones that I keep in my. I'm I'm surprised. I thought I thought Madonna would have been on the list. I thought that uh, uh, Pet Shop Boys might have. I just bought an OG pressing from the shop where I work of West End Girls. But I, yeah, for that stuff, I, I, but I, I I mean I mean like I love those tricky records. I feel like the the trickies, the Nearly God album and uh, and uh, Premillennium Tension. Or two of the greatest electron because they're it, that's just turning it into something else. That's like post rave chill out music, but it's as my a friend of mine used to put it, he's like, it's not chill out music, it's crack house music, but it just like it's a come home and just twist something. I, I think like pre millennium attention, but yeah, moving things forward. I, I'm trying to think of it like I think of like Billy Idol's Rebel Yell, which is actually very much an electronic record. It's a whole drive, it's like him and Steve Stevens, but it's it's. Or, or, you know, in that same vein, like ZZ Top's Eliminator. Because here you have a Texas, like, boogie, like, rock, blues or band. It, that's all, that's an electronic record. With, yeah, drums, like, for sure. It's all, were, like, yeah. They were not, I, yeah. I, so those kind of opened the doors. And people, a big one for me when I was a kid was The Art of Noise's Invisible Silence. Uh, incredible. Peter, just, Gun, Peter Gunn. Yeah. I just, well, I, I just talked about that recently on an episode. It's such a good record. Amazing. I know the one after, In No Sense Nonsense is great. And then they kind of lost the plot. But, uh. But speaking of, Keith Forsey, who produced Rebel Yell for Billy Idol, worked for The Art of Noise. It's just to that. But yeah, I, I'm obsessed with Madonna's Borderline right now. Like, I, I bought a copy of her first album to play because my, my, my gal loves it, Madonna. But uh, for some reason, like, border, Borderline just has become. I do this, I obsess on things. But I. I uh, uh, so I bought a copy of the. The first Madonna album uh, a few weeks ago, and it's amazing. Like you forget, like you get holiday, but then you you forget about Lucky Star, Borderline, and Burning Up. Um, and that's like she roped Jellybean Benitez in to do 
holiday and then most of like a virgin and he was like an underground like house producer basically so anything that kind of pushes it into the mainstream i don't know i haven't answered your question but i, I try to think of stuff in my you got you like, got what well, you got one in there and maybe maybe one and a half i'm not sure it could be even two and a half i'm just trying to think of things like tricky I like. records like. yeah i i uh i'm trying to think of stuff i like when i'm actually like like mixing records like things i want to just throw on to destroy people you know if i think about stuff that that really transformed the climate you know early on i would think about prodigy experience i love pleasure from the bass by tiga that's a great track i t t that all the tiga stuff actually what and actually what's the boom boom boom, boom. i'll come back to it it's another bass that's another bass one tiga's a game changer he was like i love what he did because he kind of i mean even when he was just a dj he would mix Brodsky beat with spastic. You know, you'd hear, like there was no differentiation between new wave and, and, and like new wave synth pop and techno. Like he was a techno DJ, but he would play pop. And I, I like that. And then when he started making his own records, fuck oh, man, like the, the first two are amazing. And I, but that's the thing, I, I like stuff that breaks down boundaries. I, 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 and I, it's hard to, I can't, I, everyone, you know, people are always like, what's your favorite show ever? What's your favorite band ever? It's hard when you've spent your whole life doing this stuff to pick just three. And I don't know that I could pick just three. I think about, you know, the first time I, I hear something. Like the first time I, I heard like Defunk by Daft Punk. And you're like, what the fuck is this? Right, and then that became like a huge mainstream thing, and you're like, I was, you know, we were right. There's I another, love. There's, I there's love. another example of a song that is absolutely underground. Yeah, and that but just suddenly like cracked wide open. Some people would say it would be the Spike Jones video is the thing that moved yeah. it into that direction. Which is probably the best video ever made. I, I, I still like the I, sad dog. I, I, the sad I, dog on crutches. Is, I mean, burden. For, yeah. The the video yeah, Punk, yeah, yeah. that's a that's an incredible video. I love that video still. I, I recently just rewatched it. And it, it feels like all of the uh Aphex Twin videos and Chemical Brother videos that were coming out in it, Remember the video for Come to Daddy by Apex Twin, the Chris Cunningham one? Well, well, I mean, Chris Cunningham and... Apex Twin is a big one for me, by the way. I would say I Care Because You Do is up there with my favorite. Right, okay, so, so and, and again, another example of something that was very, like... Somehow he got a major label deal the, on Madonna's label. The, you, it's he just, bought a tank. It's one of these things is not like the other, so, you know, or, or it's like, or it's like, like, how? Right? How so, did this happen? Right, but... But it did, and and it had an effect. I'm 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 working with somebody right now that you know really got into electronic music because of Aphex Twin, and everything that that we do together has no like I don't feel the callback to it at all. Like there's never a point where I, I'm sitting down with them. Oh. Oh, like like there's not there's not that realization and 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 it's to me this is interesting because we'll take some stuff in but what we what we give out after we've got it in is something else well that's i know but my my musical diet's been completely om omnivorous my whole life too so i i i you know it's some people like i don't see color i don't see gender but it's like i like m music is just I like I like stuff that transcends. I think it's cool when you you know like when somebody who says, "Oh, I don't listen to that," you know, I don't listen to pop music. Can you play them like a Lady Gaga tune? And they're like, "Oh, it's pretty good." You know what I mean? But I I like that. I like I like stuff that erodes those boundaries. But I also love stuff that's like like mid period Apex Twin that's so totally <laughs> confrontational and like a, like completely bloody-mindedly oblivious to whatever the audience wants. Like, so he's like that, come to daddy's a good example. There's some stuff, on the, some of the B-sides on that 12-inch, or, or that, that EP, but like, Bucephalus bouncing ball, where it's just basically the boom, 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 boom. It's like, sounds like a ball bouncing, you know? Like, this isn't pleasurable by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> but I'm glad that you did it. You know, and I, I like, I like that stuff. I like, I like, I think New Order are amazing for that too. Like I, Joy Division is probably my favorite rock band of all time. But the fact that, 
And they got, like, New Order got flack. It was like, they're using synths and sequencers and drum machines. And yet they, you went from this, in, like, fucking amazing post-punk band that only managed two records that changed the entire trajectory of, like, rock music. And then, hey, now we're going to make dance music. This is music production boogeyman. Yeah. Right? This is the, this is the bad thing that, that people, you're, don't, yeah. don't do that. These aren't real instruments. Right. Like, like OMD. OMD were huge for that. OMD and now, it's, now it's absolutely normalized, right? It's almost like, what do you mean? There's no synth. Well, like, you listen to, like, like My Chemical Romance Record or it's not one of these, like it's all pro tool. They're right. electronic records. All these rock. I'm sure the last Weezer album is moving files around. And it, but you know when when we were kids, there were legitimate this. Like I remember reading a review of the Art of Noise as a visible silence in my one of my father's stereo review records, and it was the the lead was like I don't want to call this the death of music. But this is the death of... That was the end of the <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then you... But then, like, there'd be discussions like, like Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark or Depeche Mode. It's like, oh, they use synths. It's not a real band. It's like, well, fuck off. It's a real band. Like, this is real... These are real songs. This is real music. But there was that attitude. And then it kind of persisted. I would say, like, I, again, when I, late, late 80s, early 90s, when I was, like, got into, like, raving... A lot of my raucous friends were like, ah, it's not real music. There's no, there's no song. I said, yeah, but you're not really listening. But I get it. When I go to a Grateful Dead, I hate the Grateful Dead, too. But I probably, if I investigated it. But it's that kind of thing. Oh, that's not real music. Right? So it's the gradual attrition. It's a war of attrition. And you get people on. But now pretty much every record is like, eh, on, like all those, any, almost any like, terrible mainstream rock record is, is done on a computer. Right? Like, they made auto-tune and they, you know, it's like, Basically, the machines are winning. We've attained the singularity. <laughs> it's coming. Ben, thanks a lot for being with us. It was a genuine pleasure, my friend. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, even my kid does it better now. Let's do that again. Bam! Whoosh! Uh, was that, uh, the lack of sound effect was... Yeah, that's probably it. I just needed, like, where's the, where's the sound effects guy? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go, finally. Thanks. Someone's pulling his weight. <laughs> Yeah, it was a pleasure. I'd, I'll, I'd happily come back. Wow. Yeah. Love it. Once. Our first our first day together it was such a success. Yeah. Who would have thought after that one swipe? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know which way you swipe because I've been to the same place. And person. absolutely appreciate each and every one of you tuning in with us tonight. And for all the shows as well that are in the archive, you can find us, utilityroom.ca, for all of your utility room needs. Lots of adventures waiting for you. And we will see you next week. My name is Jello. This is Ben Rayner. We are in the utility room. You're absolutely awesome sauce. Thanks very much. <laughs>